Welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to this DLR Open Search Colloquium. We've done this type of colloquia in the past two years. We had a little bit of a break in, in early 2023 when we were transitioning from our first DLR Open Search project to our next and current one that we have put on now for the next four years where we are working across at least three uh, DLR institutes, but of course together with many other groups and, and players on the Open Search Initiative in Europe. So and in this European Open Search Initiative, we are trying to inspire Europe and work across Europe with computing centers, with experts in information retrieval, computer science, web information, uh, web, web science, if you wish, to make, to generate an infrastructure and ecosystem that allows public and open search. And it's my great honor and, and pleasure also today to welcome Benno Stein, a professor um, for Intelligent Information Systems at the Bauhaus University in Weimar. And uh, Benno is, is a serious capacity in information retrieval uh, here in, in, in Europe. And it's really great to have you here today and talk to us about some of your thoughts in, in cognitive biases and information retrieval. Because we always say, okay, we want to get access to unbiased information through such open search systems. But the question is, can we actually have that? Is it is it feasible? And actually, do we want this? And that's part of your your discussion, I think. Because at some bias, at, at some stage, we need some kind of um, narrowing down of information, and, and we need some kind of yeah view to to information. And so I think we accept the bias as long as it's our bias. <laughs> but no, <laughs> the question is uh, on on whether that's that's good or, or even possible. So we are very much looking forward to your uh, thoughts, Benno. Yeah, thank you very much, Stefan, for this uh, really warm introduction. Actually, part of this talk has been given um, at a keynote last year in Clay, at Clay, but most of these slides are original and uh, pretty new. And um, I hope you enjoyed. And um, we will provide this material also for your for you later, because uh, there's a lot of information uh, which I cannot present in detail properly now. Yes, cognitive biases and information retrieval. And uh, I would like to start uh, quite informal and and easy um, with, with the following. Yeah, here's a concept learning task. We, we see chairs, and I, I would like to learn uh, what a chair is, yes. I know about deep learning, about contrastive learning, but uh, take this as an example to think about features. How would you classify these, these three chairs? And at first sight, we could say a chair has four legs and it has a brown color. Of course, this is not everything what the chair is characterized by, but at first sight, we can say so. And if we now see a cow, of course, a cow has also four legs, a cow is also brown, but it's not a chair. And the famous chair, Marcel Breuer, Bauhaus University, this, this has to be shown, of course, from the famous Bauhaus, this chair is a valid chair, a great chair, but it's neither brown nor has it four legs. Clear enough what I want to express here. We are economical. We quickly learn from few examples to classify many chairs, but we have a deficit in precision. We classify non-chairs as chairs. And of course, we have a deficit in recall. We cannot classify all chairs. I bring this example because what we learn, what we see, what we are reminded here is bias for decision finding. And I will deepen this and different aspects from this in the next um, half hour. The talk will be about, uh, Stefan asked me yesterday, 30 to 40 minutes. And that means I will skip uh, certain things and um, go uh, into details on it at a few places. The, third, uh, the talk has three parts. Um, for me, it was important when I talk about bias to to clarify what what is bias. If we, if I ask ten people what bias is, I get ten different answers and explanations, and I understand that I get ten different answers and explanations. And I want to be comprehensive here. I think the first part of this talk uh, will give my comprehensive view, and I hope that it will cover a lot of um, meanings and interpretations of bias. The second part will address um, cognitive bias in information um, retrieval. Uh, 
Information retrieval has a certain responsibility. We ask information retrieval systems if we are uh, at an information need, if we need information, if we are under pressure. And this is a big position, and we depend on these machines. And cognitive biases uh, play their role in the positive and in the negative part. And the third part of this talk, I would like to uh, present some related research of our uh, babies group. And um, each of these parts can be deepened. And um, I will start with the meanings of bias in a short historical Oh, yeah, yes, and this is also nice. I have, for entertainment purposes and amusement, uh, some of the examples. Uh, this is uh, an illustration of confirmation bias. Yeah, you see it is in front of us is a person uh, who uh, belongs to the Flat Earth community and uh, now found a book that, in fact, proves that the planet Earth is flat and he already knew it. Yes, this is... Uh, a typical bias if we if we see a person or uh, information that matches our mental model we are directly in favor yes um, bias has acquired a, a derogatory definition uh, if i have presented the definition of webster's dictionary from 1913 there was a bias defined as a leaning of the mind as kind of inclination, repossession, propensity towards an object, not leaving the mind indifferent, saying something specific. And if we look today at Merriam-Webster 2022, we see that it is explained as personal and sometimes unreasoned judgment as a kind of prejudice. This is what changed uh, with, with this term. This might be useful or not. I only present this without saying what I like. We see there, hence, two kinds of synonyms that, that we can form. Bias can be considered as non-objectivity, again, as prejudice, as one-sidedness, as tendentiousness. Yes, this is all a bit of negative or very negative, but um, bias is also seen as a rule of thumb, as a heuristic or a cognitive bias. There are some people who say a heuristic, if applied by human leads to cognitive bias, for instance. Many famous and very well-educated people have told a lot about bias. I have um, taken a deep look last year over several weeks, and I've mentioned them only uh, to show you them there. And um, what I like is um, the Oxford Handbook definition of Cleo Tilti Gonzalez. She defines heuristics. Now, as shortcuts that human use to reduce task complexity and bias as resulting gaps which can entail negative or positive effects between normative behavior and the heuristically determined behavior. Before bringing one definition after the other, I, I would like to, to point out two, two different players, two camps of interpretation. This is the famous uh, Daniel Kahneman who uh, wrote the book, uh, So and Far Thinking, you might uh, have heard about this. And uh, his uh, opponent, let's say, a scientific uh, counterpart uh, from the different camp, uh, Georg Gigerenzer, who is thinking of simple heuristic that makes us smart. And he complains, Gigerenzer, I will show you this, in, 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 his, uh, in a paper that is a term heuristic has acquired a different connotation. It underwent a shift from being regarded as a method that makes computers smart to one nowadays. It explains why people are not smart. And although Kahneman shows both elements, both sides in his books and in his papers, he, uh, he is very well known for the experiments that were designed to show that heuristics do not work. It was repeatedly emphasized that heuristics are sometimes good and sometimes bad, but in every experiment that he shows, shows only the danger. And this is the main um, impact and the main um, way we consider bias nowadays. Um, as a first takeaway in this regard, uh, the takeaway message is when I talk about bias, and you might um, do the same, 
first distinguish whether the people talk about a procedure or algorithm or a calculus to do something. And on the other side, the impact or the effect of this. And think twice before thinking <laughs> the effect or impact is negative, neutral or positive. A neutral interpretation, which I will provide also, is that a heuristic, I use this term because bias and bias, the information processing heuristic go often hand in hand. A heuristic is a procedure, a calculus, a calculus which is not complete or not sound. And this is very clear, this is accepted. You have a procedure, you have a way to do things, and you know you are not complete. That means you leave out the perfect solution, or you get the uh, chance to leave out the perfect solution, and so on. And this is a heuristic. And a bias is a consequence of this. You have to pay for this. And it is on your side whether you want to pay this, you can pay this, or you must pay this. The incurred consequences for not being complete or sound are called systematic error or bias. And if you knew all this, here for entertainment purposes, this is so-called hindsight bias. Yeah. If, the, if, you, if, you ask, if you ask you something before an event happens, you, you usually don't know, but after the event has happened, you, you knew it all better and you have known it before. Yeah. This is a very human behavior stereotype and uh, it's called hindsight bias. Yeah. And if you cannot read what's written there, I'm not sure. And the, 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 the comic says, although we gave him all that money and support, I always had my doubts that Jim could build his own helicopter. You see in the background the fresh helicopter. Okay, um, now comes something which I fulfilled um, was a very important wish of my side last year. I, I tried to bring together um, a complete coverage of the meaning bias from different sites. Um, when I talk to, to people uh, about media bias, cognitive bias, they often do not know about the, the rule and the importance of bias in other fields. And if they know about inductive bias or statistical bias, they often tell me this is something completely different. Yeah, statistical bias and cognitive bias is something completely different. And um, to directly say it and to make it a bit easy and polarizing, um, I don't think so. I think there I have the same root, and there are uh, not only great similarities. Um, this is one scale of information we are talking about and the uh, effects we are talking about. They have more or less the same root, and um, I would like to explain this. Um, what I wanted to pre uh, also do last year with this analysis, it's not so old, half a year old, this analysis, is uh, to bring a, a complete coverage of, of uh, uh, the term bias, how it's used in different disciplines. So statistical bias, uh, to give you a first impression, is uh, the term that we use if we measure the deviation of a random variable or a statistic from its true value. Yeah, we, we do this for certain reasons, and this is called statistical bias. The so uh, inductive bias, it belongs to machine learning. Yeah? Uh, the inductive bias, um, um, are principles to, to guide the search, to look only at certain places, to, to have um, a focused uh, view or a, a small hypothesis base uh, that is considered only. And so cognitive bias, and this um, could be in one sentence uh, expressed as rational deviation from logical thought. Uh, of course, it, give, uh, it requires deeper explanation, but we can keep it for the moment. You also see that if I have a differentiate between bias and algorithm on the left hand side, the gray box, and bias in data. And uh, bias in data is perhaps easier to be treated in that sense that the people are very clear what this means. Um, for now, and in this talk, I'm only talking about bias and algorithm. Of course, you know there's bias in data, but uh, uh, for the purpose of this talk, I focus on the left side, by the Yeah, the statistical view. Um, I thought this is important. Perhaps you are annoyed if you see this again. You might have been tortured for this diagram which you see in the, the bottom right corner. Um, it is 
a, a very important concept in statistics um, where we create unbiasedness uh, for error reduction. If, if you look at this, this, this formula here, it says the mean squared error, the error of something that we compute, it can be decomposed of a statistic, of a, 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 a random variable. It can be decomposed in the square of the bias plus a variance plus, plus some noise. And uh, what is expressed is this is the following. If, if you measure something and uh, you are only allowed to take a sample, this is the normal case, uh, you use, have to use this sample to estimate your parameters. And um, if you have a fantastic model, which models each and everything, your parameters are not enough uh, to, uh, to get a precise estimate of the parameters. And then you are on the, on the blue curve. Yeah? You have a high complexity, this is written here, a high number of parameters, and you are not able to estimate them accurately. And uh, that means you get error due to your imprecise estimation. This is uh, the variance. On the other side, if you have a very simple model, like we saw at the beginning, a chair has four legs and is brown, yes, then it's easy to determine the, the number four. And it's easy to determine the color. The parameters can be estimated very precisely, but the high bias introduces a high error, which we see here. This is a, this is a purple curve. And what we find, have to find, is the optimum, which is the sum of these two. And this uh, gives us the minimum error. And this is a, a thing that a statistics person or a machine learning person has to decide. It depends on the size of the data, of the reliability of the data, of the possibility of the models, the computation time. It's, it's very complicated and very difficult to assess this. And already here, I would like to point that, that this definition um, already um, is connected to Gonzalez's definition. Uh, in this definition, in this uh, image, what we uh, see here on the right-hand side, and where we see the effects here, model A is um, precise but has a high bias, and model C is consistent, we say consistent, but has a high variance, and model B might reduce task complexity, entails bias, but reduces the error. If we go to inductive bias, we go to machine learning. We, we say, OK, we have our statistics, we have our way to compute parameters, but the hypothesis space, the possible number of uh, the possible variances of this model, the, the instances of the model um, are too many. I cannot look at each of them. For instance, in deep learning, our error curves are, of course, not a convex, but we still apply a gradient descent. Yes. And um, this is, of course, an inductive bias. We, we, we know we have not enough time, and we have to uh, focus on something. We have to simplify the search. We have to simplify assumptions to get the thing uh, done at all. And uh, you might have seen these figures, which we see below. It is easy or easier to, to find a linear uh, separating plane than a curved one or one which is so complex like here. And from left to right, we uh, reduce the bias. If we consider each point as its own class, the data structure for this is called hash table, we have no bias, but we are not able to do any prediction anymore. That means no bias, means no prediction. Or like Mitchell, Schaffer, Dembski, and others, and Chris Bishop say, learning without bias is futile. I have given you also some very well-known examples. The simple principle of parsimony, small is quick. The first solution, if it's small, I can uh, quicker verify this. I take the nearest neighbor instead of look at many neighbors. In deep learning, there, there are already these, these um, inductive bias concept, drop-out, structured perception, and so on. Let's go to cognitive bias. This is a behavioral economics view. And cognitive bias, I told already, systematic patterns of deviation from norm or rationality in judgment. 
mental shortcuts that the brain used to produce decisions and judgments. And there's a lot of controversy to explain cognitive bias, to classify them, to organize them, and to, to show all these different schools that have been developed to, to, to go through this forest of all these possible cognitive bias, it would take hours. Um, I present um, a well-known school for the moment, but this is not the only school, but this will help us in the future here for analyzed biases in information retrieval. And this is the taxonomy, the classification scheme that is addressed as information problems. It was suggested by Buster Benson. Um, he has worked on this several years. And he says he organizes cognitive biases according to four problems. We have too much information for me to have to pick one. We have not enough meaning. That means we cannot interpret. We have not enough time. We need to act fast. And we ask ourselves what is important. And um, there are about, you can do your own guess, think about how many cognitive bias are seriously discussed, about 200. And um, Buster Benson uh, took some time to organize these 200 cognitive bias types into a graphics. And um, I will show these graphics because it, it's very nice. And I guess some of them, or perhaps many of them know it already, the so-called cognitive bias cortex. I don't know whether you can read this. The cognitive bias cortex, I, I can um, zoom a bit in, lists all these 200 biases. For instance, if I, I look at um, confirmation bias, yeah, you see it here. Here's a confirmation bias. It is um, it belongs to too much information. And if if you click on this, it's quite nice. You 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 are taken to a Wikipedia article which which tells about this. A quite nice thing, and and, and to, to work with. And um, we'll come back to this cognitive bias in the next later. What I also analyzed uh, last year, but I will skip over this, is that these three groups of biases, statistical bias, inductive bias, and cognitive bias, um, entail each other. If, if you um, introduce statistical bias, you also introduce inductive bias and vice versa. And I have given examples here um, that by regularization, for instance, um, like uh, the Lasso method, um, you have inductive bias, which reduces the number of parameters and which introduces statistical bias, for instance. But I skip over this. I only want to show you this, that these two things, statistical bias and inductive bias, have the same core. A similar um, argument applies uh, to cognitive bias, inductive bias. Not all cognitive bias have inductive biases at their root, but many. Cognitive and inductive bias entail each other um, concept learning, for instance, we saw it at the beginning is such a thing. We have no time and uh, we, we consider only a small parameter space and uh, this uh, leads to um, an inductive bias, which also can be a cognitive bias, because not all chairs have four legs and are brown. Mm. Interestingly, statistical bias and inductive bias are easy to formalize. Um, they are not easy to optimize, I would say. It's an alchemic discipline. Cognitive biases are hard to formalize. There's a discussion in the field of behavioral economics, sociology, politics, psychology. What are, in fact, cognitive biases? Does the Dunning-Kruger effect, in fact, uh, exist, or is it only an invention? Even this famous cognitive bias is not clear. Inductive and statistical bias are optimized against the mathematical function. Cognitive biases depend on your inclination, cultural backgrounds, the zeitgeist, 
the experiences, the profession that you go. And there is no unified value system for the mathematical quantification. And this makes it so difficult to deal with that. However, I don't want to show only problems. I want to show how these things are connected together. And to say there is a mathematics also partly behind cognitive bias, which has a lot to do with statistics and machine learning. Yes, and uh, of course, this is a source of, of misunderstanding. Yeah? We, we, we all, all only talk about bias, and we leave all these uh, implications and disconnections um, out. And this uh, also concludes the first part of, of my talk. Um, information retrieval, which leads to the second part, is challenged in particular. Uh, with regard to data and with regard to cognitive bias. As I told at the beginning, an information retrieval system shall us help us if we are in a pro uh, problematic situation. We are under stress, we need information, we have a deficit, we have an information need, we want to be satisfied with regard to an answer, and this makes us vulnerable to certain things, vulnerable to wrong answers, to quick answers, and so on. And information retrieval has hence a special responsibility to deal with this. Yeah, addressing cognitive bias with IR, uh, that means what can information retrieval do uh, to, to help to mitigate the effects of cognitive biases. And before I, I do this, I give for those of you who are not so deep into IR, um, the classical abstract envisioned IR Pipeline. The information retrieval pipeline starts from left to right. Uh, we see here seven fields. Some people have five fields, but uh, more or less it is uh, in this way it works. We have at the beginning the acquisition of information. And this is also interestingly exactly the position where we are with our um, EU project. We are at the crawling situation. Um, we think have to think this is uh, the next steps, which we also do in the EU project, think about uh, user models, um, how to formalize information need, how to model, which kinds to model uh, of the documents, the information retrieval model, um, how to rank them, how to verify ranks, how to present results, and think about how people um, consume the results. And these uh, seven steps um, should be um, uh, Always, it should always be in our mind if we talk about cognitive biases, because each of the step has its own kind of biases, and each of the step has its own kind of countermeasures to address biases. Um, the heart of IR's evaluation, I don't need to, to tell is um, we want to understand what we are doing is right. And um, in this sense, I have mentioned famous papers that uh, and, uh, which have been developed in this regard and which we um, already know. There have been new papers on evaluation. This is very clear, but um, these are uh, very valuable to read and I suggest to, to, to get them read. I have uh, put a star here with Tivko Saravich, evaluation of evaluation information retrieval, a really nice paper. I yesterday took again a, a read on this. and. He has also brought this distinction, which we see at the bottom. He distinguishes four, four levels, the use and user level, where certain misbehavior and behavior happens, the output level, the processing level, this is a system-oriented view, the input level, and um, the, which we call together the engineer. And um, I don't want to... Um, uh, uh, to, to bring information to people who, who all know this, but for those who don't know, think we go for collecting, modeling, and, um, extracting, and presenting. And in these steps, many things can go wrong. And there's a paper of life, also part of which I found really inspiring, who, who mentions and lists and describes cognitive biases in search. And he shows what information retrieval does, uh, uh, goes wrong, and uh, supports in a negative way cognitive biases. For instance, um, we have stopped thinking 
I do rather remember the so-called Google effect. Or we believe in the first result, anchoring bias. Or we take a query suggestion because, ah, it's so easy. Other people are also looking for that. I will also look for this. Um, we have our certain places where we go to ambiguity effect. We often overestimate our um, ability to find relevant items. If, if you ask information seeker and ask them whether they have seen everything, yes, they say yes. They have seen everything. And um, yeah, of course, there are a lot of other things, but these are very typical examples. And in, in this talk, I want to talk about or mention that IR can mitigate cognitive biases. Life at the party shows uh, the, the harm that the IR does, and we want to show here that uh, the same way it can also mitigate. In the next um, analysis, uh, uh, from which I present a few excerpts, uh, was uh, strongly supported on our side from Johannes Kiesel. Johannes Kiesel and me did this um, together. And what we did was, we, we took this, this seven steps here, and we took all cognitive biases here, this uh, 200, which you see here, and uh, uh, looked which kind of information retrieval technology in the last 20 years is able to do in which step something good. And uh, this is uh, the... Uh, this is a lot what we found out, and I show you only a few results. You see steps at the bottom. You see here the overview of these cognitive biases. And um, if, if I zoom in, you see that some of these um, here are uh, shown in purple. And these are um, cognitive bias for which we saw information retrieval. Um, a, a technology that helps. And um, for instance, in the first step, um, if we do not acquire the documents that have the re relevant information, of course, we cannot provide uh, good information. You know, we are not complete. And especially in health and medicine and politics, this play a role. And the term systematic review, you might have heard this. This is very popular in medicine. This is uh, the most effective or the, the most serious analysis of a topic that, that you can do. However, it takes a lot of time. You, you try to uh, look at all papers that have been published and try to present them. And um, uh, in this regard, there has been technology, and this is what we see here. This, uh, this way the slides are organized. Um, even in the track conference, the famous track conferences, there is a so-called boss, a so-called total recall track, where uh, systems are measured with regard to their ability to find all relevant documents. Um, I've also here um, a nice figure, the availability heuristic, yes, you take the first um, result, it's a, the best one here, you see here a couple in front of a sea, the couple is eating junk food, drinking beer and smoking, but has just read about shark attacks here, and uh, right, they must have a death wish to swim in that water. Yeah? You see, they, they, this is what they just saw, and they do not see their own eating behavior, they see what they just read. Um, I see I am quickly running out of time, and I <laughs> will jump over a few things now, Stefan. You can also uh, come in and tell me if I'm too slow. I will jump um, um, over things. No, I think it's, it's good. Take, take a five or Ten more minutes, so it, it will shorten a bit the discussion. But but please um, no, no, it's go ahead, Benno. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. But uh, I'm very happy also to be interrupted. I, I don't want to. It, the, the most serious um, anxiety I have is that I'm, I'm boring people. Yeah, the people are not interested in listening. No, it's interesting stuff. Please, please go ahead, and and it's it gives quite a quite a, you open up a quite a quite a big uh, diversity and and a big big um, yeah field uh, thinking about bias, and it's it's great in in our domain. So please go ahead. Okay. But I think it, you should uh, also allow for some questions. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, I will uh, go ahead. Um, uh, I will 
um, we have a little bit of a look at the confirmation bias. We, we saw it already before. We like to believe things that match our mental model. And um, there, uh, information retrieval can do a lot. Um, I've here, um, uh, together with Johannes, I would like to mention this, uh, found uh, uh, mention two papers that um, improves the query presentation, yes, the auto-completion. You know, with auto-completion, you, you have power in your hand to complete in that way that it's become diverse, or let's say unbiased. You can nudge searches towards critical queries. There's, um, in, in, in their paper, for instance, they, they auto-complete, and after the auto-completion, they enter the word study, proof, more evidence, and this teases you as, as a reader or um, a person who looks for something because, yes, you want to argue why is something correct, and you are reminded with this kind of auto-completion uh, to do this. Yes, um, um, information retrieval system can assist in checking claim veracity. Yeah? Um, we can use uh, systems that present facts to check these facts. And there is from, um, uh, from Narkov, Preslav Narkov, uh, the lab on detecting fact check claims. And here, information retrieval can help um, to extract and show things that are clear, that are fact-checked, and things that are questioned. Um, we can do better in ranking. We can do, let's say, a kind of fair ranking in that sense that we can tweak results to reflect normative distributions. This goes into the direction of affirmative action. It is questionable, it's discussable. But uh, this can be a technology that makes sense, especially for people who believe in the, or belong to the group of naive realism, which says that the all people who believe the same in-group are on the right side and the out-group people are egocentric and um, the common sense understanding what you are, it's on your side is the only truth. Especially in politics and in political ideolo ideologies, this is a very common, um, uh, a very common uh, bias. Um, Resulting result presentation, it has to do with framing. Framing is the thing where we can, in fact, do something. Here again, for your entertainment purposes, um, I will read it for you, um, demonstration of a framing effect. 5% carbon emission were achieved. And uh, you can frame it as a great success. Here on the left-hand side, you can say, just 4.6% the last five years is not a lot. You can frame it as a negative result. And uh, the framing is uh, also, from my personal opinion, one of the most important things we should look at because it, uh, it forms your understanding and your um, uh, categorization of the numbers that you take. I even find it more important than fact -check. is as shown as example here for result consumption. If I explain things overcomplicated, my audience gets lost. This is shown here. A nice teacher who tells something about Goncharov polylogarithms, very complicated, cannot understand that the audience is doing each and every thing and playing around, but not looking at this. Curse of knowledge means you understand a thing very well and you think all others do as well. This does not mean that we should oversimplify a thing, but this does mean um, that we can think about technology that makes information more accessible. For instance, if we are thinking about um, images that support certain arguments, we are doing such a thing. 
Um, this closes to the second part um, of the talk, uh, talk. The second part was um, information retrieval and its application for fighting, addressing, or um, acting against cognitive biases. In the last part of the talk, um, I will show related research at Belvis and we can uh, that means that our research groups, uh, combined research group of Jena, Matthias Hagen, um, Martin Potas, um, Khalid al khatib in Groningen, Henning Wachsmuth in Hannover and ourselves here in Bayern. And I would like uh, to start with a discussion which we have had quite often. It is the introduction of the, let's say, the, the pride of information retrieval, short answers, direct answers. You, you type in how long do cats live and you get a direct answer, 15 years. Uh, you don't get it at the moment, it was a few years old, two years old, it worked two years ago, but nowadays it might not work again. And this is a striking answer. It is, you, we were unexpected to see this answer, but it's, it's nice. I have a question, I get an answer, I'm satisfied or not. Konrad Lischka was not satisfied. He asked, how does Google know when my cat will die? And what is missing in direct answer is rationalization. They could have told a cat that lives at home, an indoor cat, on average, if it's a, a, a European house cat, IHK, it lives an average 15 years. This is clear, but this does not apply to any kind of and in this regard, from this discussion, Martin Potters started his discussion, the dilemma of the direct answer. We became convenient, and uh, the choice between our convenience and the diligence in using an information retrieval uh, system, this is the dilemma that we have. Um, there's a paper about this, and this paper gives the following example. If I have a factoid question, you know, like, uh, what is the speed of light? It's about 300,000 kilometers uh, per second, uh, they will need a direct answer. They want to have it. What's uh, the height of the Eiffel Tower? This is clear. But already the next question, what can be done about overpopulation? A direct answer, it's difficult. The answer here is quite okay. It mentions five possible solutions. But if you go to the third example, what is the impact of CRISPR-Cas9? CRISPR-Cas9 is a uh, gene scissors. It might shape our lives extreme in the next 20 to 50 years. It's a very complicated thing. What is its impact? And this to discuss this cannot be done with a, with a, with a direct answer. And interestingly, the, the difficulty from the question from left to right becomes from easy fact to eat to very complicated and you see the answers become even shorter. This might be a coincidence, but this shall demonstrate that direct answers are a possibility, but no cure all. The direct answers amplify, and now I speed a bit, various cognitive biases, authority bias, confirmation bias, and realism. I will jump over this. I will show or demonstrate that direct answers are, have a historical context. And uh, since several thousand years, we are looking for information. And direct answer, at the end of the developments, um, we, we are going, if we, if we look here at the top, at speed, and uh, the user workload becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, and we want to get at high speed an answer which takes no effort for us. And this is a problem. This all here introduces bias. Um, you can read the paper I go over this year. The interesting uh, thing that we said in the paper is perhaps the, the most, the time where we were most seriously about information, where the best trade off between speed and um, effort to get information is perhaps already done. At the moment, we see we are confronted with users who are not very diligent, who are convenient and take the first answer as well. Um, what to do in this regard? This is perhaps the second or third takeaway. There are two extreme answers. More power to the machine. 
makes the machine even more smarter, makes the machine aware of all biases, makes the machine identifying who's the person in front of it, makes the machine understanding the whole history of my zeitgeist and gives the right answer, or on the other side, empower the user, support the liberation, raise awareness, demonstrate what can be done, provide meter information. And uh, we at Babys go, at least at the moment, this way, it's empower the user way. And our technology, which we have provided or which we develop, and also the search engine in the EU project we are developing, we are part of the developers, we are very proud to be part of this, um, we see it more on the right-hand side. We want to empower the user. We want to give the user the possibility to argue for herself. And in this regard, I even make it a bit quicker. I present three developments and then I will close. Um, we have developed uh, several technologies. You see them here, uh, one to seven. And I will go only on the one thing into which we really believe, rationalization. We think if we explain answers, if we explain results, then we do a good job. It's not so easy like it sounds. We have a search engine, for instance, I can enter, uh, I will do this for you, um, vegetarianism, and look what the search engine says. It's an argument search engine. And what I see at first, there are pro and con. This is an interesting site. This is something we learn. However, it takes a lot of time to look at all arguments, but this is the first thing we can learn. And we can also learn from which directions are the pro and con arguments. There's something to do with nutrition, cancer, obesity, yes, evolution, hygienism, and so on. But it takes diligence to analyze all this. In the next evolution step, this is uh, driven by Johannes Kiesel, he asks, can we make argument digestible by showing images Here we can, for instance, look at the topic. He has presented 40 topics. Um, I don't know whether... Here, sh should people become vegetarian? Yeah, this is quite nice. This is a similar thing. And we see on the left-hand side, the pro um, the side images that says, yes, why not become vegetarian? On the right-hand side, we see images. Why not become vegetarian? We are also eating living objects. Yeah. But this is quite nice. I do not become a vegetarian for my health. I did it for my health of the chickens. I like this. And since I like this, I have put this into a value analysis machine, also provided by Johannes Kieser, quite nice. This is uh, his uh, recent research. He's also asked what are values behind the arguments? And um, he orients this values. Values are things that the, the mankind believes in what is done good. He says, uh, this sentence, I do not become vegetarian for my health, but I do it for the chickens. This has these values. I live, I, I have the value nature. I take care for my nature. I see that uh, um, 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 people and beings that depend on me. Uh, I wanted to say more about this, but I know the time is closing. I, I go out, I jump to the end, I jump over this here and uh, want, to, um, want to say thank you at this point and to give a summary to remind you what we all saw. We saw the meanings of bias and their connections. We saw that IR can do both harm and good to address cognitive biases. We don't believe that direct answers are the pride of IR, especially uh, the LLMs, although they can do such great things. It's a difficult technology, and it's a questionable to use them for everything. And um, we ask the question, more power to the machines or for the user? And with this, I would like to close and say thank you for you and thank you for the people who all helped me to present this research. Of course, this was research from all of them that you see here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Benno.
big applause. Uh, if, if we were in a room, we would hear that now. <laughs> and thank you very much for this tour de raison, for this overview and, and introducing us into this, these thoughts uh, on, on, on or in, in, in the, the complexity of bias in the information material domain. And um, I'm pretty sure there would be loads of questions and quite some, some things to discuss. And I encourage us now to, to take a few minutes at least to, to, to uh, reflect a bit on what, what Benno has, has shared with us. Are there um, thoughts? Uh, are there um, questions? Um, so, um, yeah, there's a comment. Uh, Sid says, thanks, one of the best talks he has heard this year. <laughs> uh, that's, that's nice. Um, uh, um, are there questions or... Um, yeah, yeah, probably to, 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 to start with this, but perhaps uh, this is um, a bit too much of information and we should share the, the slides. But anyway, I'm open to any questions. Yeah. So there is um, one question in the chat. Uh, what impact do you think that ChatGPT will have? And then Sebastian may just come in also um, for a question. He has raised his hand. But uh, uh, that also came to my mind now with all these language models coming up. And, and they are not so much uh, in the... Well, they, I think they introduce, will introduce or will, be, will we feed back some of the cognitive bias that can be found in the web into the, yeah. the retrieval systems, or if yes. it can be even considered a retrieval system. But if, if you like, I give you a very short answer to this. Um, I, I mentioned uh, the LLMs and the um, um, ChatGPT technology or um, similar technologies only. Um, of course, they are very well suited for us, or we are like to use them for for direct answers, but there's a danger in this. And this is not the danger on the, in the data, which I think can be more easily controlled than the, than the uh, convenience of, of the user. Um, uh, conversational search, which means we get into a dialogue with the machine. In this regard, I see a great future of uh, technology like ChatGPT. Um, however, this technology makes it easy to produce direct answers and um, direct answers can be good. And if we find out what is information need directly from the query, uh, we can much easier apply a direct answer and a ChatGPT answer, which does no harm, while in other situations when we think the answer is not so clear, we can ask in a more diverse way. That means I see a, a lot of potential, but it has to be taken uh, with care and developed with care. I'm open for technology, definitely. I'm not yeah. afraid of the GPT. Yeah, but, but of course it has a great power, but but it's the the reduction to a simple answer and in, yeah. in a very quick way. I think that's that's uh, that's a danger, and and you open up so many uh, ways to get to get a misperception or mis misleading uh, um, answer in the whole information material process. And, and uh, yeah, so uh, we should do definitely in depth thinking on whatever we do and produce here. Um, Sebastian, you, you, you raised your hand. Yeah. You want to wanna open your mic and camera and, and come in with a question or comment? I, I think you should see me, right? Um, it's positive. Yeah, all right, good. Um, so yeah, I have both a question as well as more of a starter for discussion. I, I don't know how much time we still have, but um, talking about convenience and this general stance that we at the Webus Group take towards empowering the users, the, the issue that I keep bumping my head against is how do we um, get users to appreciate um, the power that they've been given when um, the the default mode for uh, commercial search is uh, high convenience. So it's, it's sort of like getting your kids away from fast food and getting them to healthy food. Um, like, yeah, I, I don't really see a solution to that. Um, well, just a quick comment from my Oh, but maybe, maybe, uh, uh, yes, please, please, please. Please go ahead. No, no, please go ahead, Stefan. Uh, to to uh, me, yeah. this, this is the same, this, the same issue. And, and I mean, I like really this, this graph with the two balances. And, and, and I mean, what we are trying to do is, I think, still to empower the machine or, or get, get machine power in served and organized such that it empowers the user. 
I think that's what the open search uh, idea is about. So we, we generate a big machinery room um, that, that gives big power, uh, but it will be displayed and accessible such that it will allow um, the user to get access to it easily. So in the sense, what you just used, Sebastian, to me, it's, it's like um, give, presenting valuable, healthy food uh, for the kids in a way that it looks and feels like fast food, but it's good stuff. And that's that's the tricky thing, I think, what we have to do also with search. So it, it, it still have to have a good user experience, very simple. But why don't having a but why not having a, a few simple buttons there around your list of results that that you can easily tweak or you know or slider saying okay more I, mean, I need some more political answers or more sport or, or more science and, and do that very easy and but I think there's great potential for that. But sorry, that's just a quick comment uh, from my side. But but of course, Ben, over to you. What what do you yes, think? Uh, um, very short, very short. And um, the dirty answer, and this will not solve the problem. It's not a silver bullet. It's a user interface thing. And um, uh, I, um, uh, thank you, Zefa Rastian. The point that you raised is important. Um, my uh, uh, more serious address could be the following: If I have a search engine which gives quick answers in situations where these quick answers are, um, are valid. That means if the search engine is in that sense reflective, that it knows what is it doing, um, uh, I, I, I start understanding as a user, this is a quick answer which I can take. This is the first thing. Um, however, at the moment that they give quick answers to nearly everything, and here another thing I would say comes into play. If a person tells me something, a complicated question, contradictory situation and uh, comes with a clear-cut answer. I ask where this answer comes from. And um, by putting the user in this, under this pressure, the, the person under this pressure, sorry, um, I, I give feedback that I'm interested as a human to human to understand what he's doing. I'm interested in rationalization. And if I give this feedback to another user that I want to see rationalization, this user might next time take the rationalization technology from the search engine to give me this information. Because if I can set a barrier, if I talk to people, if people come to me with, with, with uh, uh, simple uh, answers to complex problems, I can say stop. I mean, this is what we teach children. If somebody gives you a too simple answer to 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 a very general thing, this this applies not for for search engines, but in in life. Then I keep my child, my children. If if the answer is too simple and too stunning, be careful. Uh, if if and, and question it. <laughs> if they the search can engine. Back, they then go back, can go back to the search engine and get the rationalizations from there. This is nice. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, any other Thank thoughts or observations um, uh, from from the colleagues? I mean, we are already running over time, so okay, uh, yeah, some really. people are already leaving, and that's fully okay. We have, all have next meetings going on. Um, so, no worries. Yeah, I mean, if the... If there are no no further questions, then then I think we call it uh, a, a meeting for now and um, and a colloquium. Thanks, Ben, for sharing this. Uh, and and it, it, there's a lot of food for thought, and, and I'm, I'm sure we will uh, pick up on on these uh, different aspects of of the, uh, the biases and and how we how we try to tackle them, or how we also use them, or how we work with them. Uh, in the coming weeks and months and years, I, I suppose, when we work on, on open uh, search and the, the ecosystems around that. Uh, thank you very much. And yeah, right. uh, once again, thanks for taking the time. And um, see you around, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.